Wait, I sat on something. Oh, ow. <laughs> Welcome, Hi. Eva Longoria, <laughs> who most of us here probably know as a Hollywood actress, but from the research that I've been doing, you're a whole lot more than that. You're a producer, director, activist, entrepreneur, philanthropist, um, but the question is, probably for lots of people here, what brings you to a web summit in Dublin? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I had never been to Ireland, and they invited me to come and speak about my philanthropy uh, and how it ties to technology. Mm -hmm. You know, I think part of the interesting thing about philanthropy or the work that I do is I realize we live in a global community. And once you accept that, you can uh, adopt different models of different countries that are doing the same thing in philanthropy. So you're not reinventing the wheel every time. Mm -hmm. uh, and a great way to share ideas and to share those models is through technology. Mm. I'm just looking at the audience, <laughs> and I barely see a female face in here. There's a couple it's females. <laughs> OK, there's some. <laughs> Apparently, there's 85% men in this audience. Yeah. And there's 30% uh, uh, of, of business leaders are women, and it's even less in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. Where are we? What, what's the problem? Where are we going wrong? Yeah. Well, I think um, traditionally, the sexism in these fields is still prevalent. I did my, my master's thesis on specifically Latinas, Latina women in STEM fields, whether it's science, technology, engineering, or math. And uh, I found that a lot of them were, are continually, even today, discouraged to go into these fields. And so I think that's something that we have to change in our educational systems. It's mm. very hard to navigate the educational system in general, and even more so when you're a woman interested in these fields and discouraged by it. And so I want to applaud all the women here today. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are um, a rare breed. And also, I want to challenge all the women here today to become mentors to younger women and show them the way and show them your path so that you can hold their hand and lift them up. Because without mentors, the system does not work. T um, do, you, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do through your foundation to empower mm -hmm. women, and specifically Latina yeah. women? Well, the Eva Longoria Foundation focuses on helping women through educational programs and entrepreneurial programs. And so the educational side that we do is we've realized in the cycle of poverty, the best intervention always is access to education. And it's an intervention that can happen at any time, whether you're young, whether you're a teenager, or whether you're an adult. You can always get your education. Mm -hmm. The problem is uh, um, the access to education. Some people live in poor neighborhoods. They go to poor schools. And so our, um, my foundation focuses on programs that help them uh, stay in school once they are in school, how to, how to uh, get a higher education, go to college, all of those programs. Parental mm -hmm. engagement, making sure your parents are engaged. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other side is entrepreneurial programs, specifically in the United States. I don't know the statistic worldwide, but women start businesses at three times the national average, women. But yet they have a very hard time gaining access to capital, mm. uh, access to business training, access to technical skills. And so I've partnered with Howard Buffett, and we have the Buffett Longoria Fund that actually um, provides all of those tools for women to be entrepreneurial and to start their own small businesses. Um, and we try to help the women who fall through those cracks of, of a normal uh, uh, system of, of trying to get loans and banks. Mm. And so that's what my foundation does. And, and in terms of your, um, your professional life working in a place like Hollywood, let's just talk about isms. isms. I mean, <laughs> sexism, racism, ageism, have you, you know, w what's been your experience with any of the above working in, in Hollywood? Um, well, I'm still young, so I haven't, I haven't quite hit the ageism yet, mm. but it's, it exists. Um, especially when I was on a show called Desperate Housewives, and it was one of the first shows where uh, most of the leads were over 40. And mm -hmm. it was a hit show, and it was a global phenomenon, and that was very rare because women over 40 have very limited, uh, l limited roles available to them. Um, 
But there is definitely, uh, you know, underrepresentation of women in film and television. And I think a large part of that is because they're not behind the camera. They're not writers. They're not enough directors. They're not enough producers that are female. Mm. And so I say this with the Hispanic community too. People yeah. go, Latinos are underrepresented in, in television and film. And I said, well, then create the story you want to see. Mm. You know, write the story you want to hear. You can't just sit back and wait for that to happen. Um, I never know whether quotes are taken out of context, oh, but I read, that, I read that you said, the best thing about being a woman is the power we have over men. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate to our 85% male audience what you meant about that? <laughs> Let me tell you something. I don't remember saying that. I probably did. Um, <laughs> but what I find is that people tend to put women in boxes. Mm. And it's like, she's sexy, she's smart, she's ambitious, she's a mom, she's uh, young, uh, she's, you know, this. Where women are very complex. Mm. And I think uh, the greatest advantage we have is that we're always underestimated. And so what we can do is uh, just continue to prove people wrong because women are all of those things at the same time. And, and possibly judged more harshly. I saw a Sandy Tosvig, you probably don't know who Andy, Sandy Tosvig is, she's a UK comedian, and she said recently, if you don't have kids and you're a woman, you're some heartless sad thing. If you do have kids and you work, you're selfish. And if you have kids and stay at home, you're lazy. It's a trap. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that conundrum? I agree. I think it is exactly that. It's a conundrum because I think women are hardest on women. You know, women make those judgments, not men. Mm. Women are the ones saying, oh, you have kids, so you stay home, so you're not ambitious. And sure. then the ones who don't have kids are, oh, you don't care mm. about, you know, so other things other than yourself, you know? And so, yeah, I, I think it's definitely a conundrum. And I think um, there's a conversation to be had on stages like this or, or, or on a world stage as far as, um, gender roles and, and, and women's identity and how, how can we be all those things? Mm. And, you know, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, kind of talks about that, of women can have it all. And I've been told women can have it all, just not at the same time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're the, I, I actually hadn't realized, I probably sh should have known this, that you'd campaign for Clinton and Obama and that you're heavily involved in politics. Mm -hmm. how, how did you get so politicized? I gather it was pre-fame that you got involved Definitely. in politics. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. They think yeah. I became famous and became philanthropic yeah. or I became famous and I became uh, a political activist. I've always been a political activist since I was 17 and campaigned for Bill Clinton on his first uh, uh, term. And I was just hooked from then. I have a very philanthropic family. Um, my oldest sister's special needs. She has a mental disability. My mother was a special education teacher for 30 years. Mm -hmm. My aunt was a volunteer in everything and dragged us along. So I knew that word volunteer very early in my mm -hmm. life. Volunteerism is very, a very big concept in my family. Um, and along those same lines, um, I always find in order to make or create sustainable change, you need the private sector and you also need the public sector, which is public policy and government and, and politics. And so that's how I got into politics was needing permanent change with a law that was affecting special needs kids or yeah. creating change for the poor people in our community that all of these charities can't possibly continue to service unless something systematically changed. Yeah. And so I find that, that my philanthropy led me to, to my political activism. And presumably you'd be supporting Hillary Clinton being <laughs> such an advocate. You know, I, t I try not to talk about the Hillary Clinton of it yet because we have a current president right now that needs a lot of help. Mm. And uh, we have elections today in the United States, big elections happening today. Uh, and we have such a great turnout in our national presidential elections, but yet nobody shows up for the midterms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a significant lower amount, lower percentage of people voting in the midterms. So we turn out to vote for the president of the United States, but yet we don't vote for the people who have to work for him mm -hmm. or work with him. And, uh, and so I think that uh, that's really important that we, we partic fully participate mm -hmm. at all times. Obviously, you're someone who has used your celebrity in, you know, to, to highlight important causes, to you know, raise awareness. But um, the flip side of fame I'd just like to touch on, John Updike said, fame is a mask that eats the face. 
is that does that ring true to you? I don't know what that How means. How do you deal with it? <laughs> well, that what fame that, that fame is an insidious thing. That actually, uh -huh. the the more you uh, identify as a famous person, the yeah. more you lose your real identity. I agree with that. Nobody, first of all, nobody wants to hear a famous person complain. You know, <laughs> they're like, oh, boo hoo. Um, but I do agree that if you allow fame to define you, that's a problem. See, I became famous very late in life according to Hollywood standards. I was 28, 29. Mm. Um, I already had my bachelor's degree. I went to college. I was very set in my identity prior to this thing called fame. And so I think fame magnifies who you are and then tries to define it. And if you let the tabloids or the news or the media define you as America's sweetheart or America's party girl or this, mm. and you kind of go, OK, that's what I am, and you just kind of go in that direction, that's when you can get into trouble. That didn't happen to me because it was, I was so set in who I was, I really didn't. It just kind of falls off my shoulder. Uh, is there anything that you wish you'd known age 13 setting out in life? Anything that you'd say to your 13-year-old self? To my 13-year-old self? Yeah. 13, God. Um, I would just say, fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> it's going to be a bumpy ride. Um, but no, you know, I love all of the experiences I've had. I really, the, the failures, the successes, I think it's all part of creating who you are today. Um, proudest achievements? What are your big uh, boasts? Other than my family, I'm so proud of my family. Yeah. Uh, my, my education, when I went back to get my master's degree, I just graduated last year. I would go to Desperate Housewives during the day, and then I'd go to night school at night on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday nights, and I would be studying on set in between takes, and I, there was a hundred times that i go, what the f am I doing? Um, yeah, this is really hard, and why am I doing this? I don't really need to do this, and it was hard and challenging in the best way, um, and I'm a curious person, so it really, uh, that side of me is so insatiable that, that getting my education helped, helped me kind of fulfill that part of me that I was like, I really, no, I really gonna, I'm gonna see this through, I'm gonna finish it. And, and it, you guys know how, how hard it is to go back when you're older to get your education. You're just like, you're, I'm too old for this. Uh, <laughs> um, so what's next? I know what's next at the summit, because we're gonna go and talk at the Food Summit about your documentary, yeah. Food Chain. But, uh, what, what next generally for you? What have you got? Um, oh, God, I, don't, I have no idea. <laughs> no, I, uh, right now I'm uh, producing and directing a lot. I'm behind the scenes, behind the camera a lot, which I've been enjoying because I like the business side mm -hmm. of our industry. Um, and I probably will be returning to television next year in mm -hmm. a new show. I don't know what it is yet, but stay tuned. Thank you very much, <laughs> Eva Longoria, for your time. Thank you. Dead on time.